Hello, I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Wired. Thank you so much for joining us on this third and final installment of Wired 25. It has been a fantastic virtual series so far. I have learned a ton. I hope you have as well. Every time I watch that video, I'm made nostalgic, but at least this week, there's a little bit of news. That dancing dog spot from Boston Dynamics, it's now actually out in the world. The one we saw out on the Embarcadero last year, it's now in Singapore patrolling a park to make sure keep, people keep social distancing. You can buy one yourself. There was one spotted in the wild in uh, Canada. You probably saw it on the internet the other night. So very exciting to see spot out there. Speaking of spot, solving problems, today is all about solving problems. It's the Wired Problem Solving Day of Wired 25. We're gonna talk to people who are working on infrastructure, who are working on public health, who are working on election security, which for everybody who watched the debate last night could not be more important. How do you keep an election safe? How do you sustain democracy? I'd like to thank our sponsor Vonage for making this possible, for allowing us to gather virtually where once we gathered in person. We're gonna talk about a bunch of different things specifically today. We're gonna to talk a lot about the fires. We have a great new cover story for Wire. The Fire Next Time by Daniel Duane. Five million acres have burned out west. Some of it because of climate change, but some of it because of policies that can shift, that can be improved, that we can do better. So we're gonna discuss that today. We're also gonna be talking a lot about the pandemic. We're we'll talking to scientists, hackers, journalists. We're we'll talking to Audrey Tong, Taiwan, Taiwan's digital minister. One of the reasons why Taiwan has done so well with coronavirus is because of the way digital democracy works there. Seven people, seven, seven, single digit, have died in Taiwan because of the coronavirus. So a very important conversation coming up there. But we're gonna start with the American response. And we're gonna start with the person most responsible for all the good things in the American response, who's leading our vaccine effort, who's become the most trusted voice in government. So let's begin the last day of Wire 25 with Dr. Anthony Fauci. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. So um, I want to thank Dr. Fauci for joining us. Uh, you know, we're very excited to have him here at the virtual Wire 25. Uh, Dr. Fauci, are you there? It's okay. It's a uh, it's a little more virtual than I thought. Um, uh, so uh, uh, while we're having some audio problems, um, I'm going to tell you that <laughs> I'm going to vamp a little and say that uh, Dr. Fauci is going to uh, talk, I hope, about the pandemic. Okay. Um, I guess we're shutting down a little while we wait for Dr. Fauci. I hope that uh, our audio uh, does um, better than we've done with the pandemic.
All right. Okay, Dr. Fauci, are you there? I'm here. I, can you hear me now? I can. You know, we're wired, right? You know, so of all the places, <laughs> we've gone, all the connections, it's the wired one which ran into trouble. What Sorry about say? that. I hope you can hear I me know, clearly now. I can hear you crystal clear. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Good to so, be with you. So here we are. October is right on us, seven months into this pandemic. And the numbers are rising again. And some states, it's the highest ever. Uh, we've had a terrible toll, 200,000 plus deaths. It's counting. The flu season is starting. How should Americans be looking at the situation now as the weather is getting cold and you know, as I mentioned, the flu season is starting and we're entering this new phase of this ongoing pandemic. Well, obviously, if you look at the numbers, it's a very challenging and serious situation because the baseline of infections each day are stuck now at around 40,000. When we had our big spikes earlier on months ago, that were dominated at first by the situation in the northeast part of the country, particularly the New York metropolitan area. Uh, when that hit hard and then came down to a baseline, the baseline never got down to what I would consider a reasonable level. It was about 20,000 cases per day. When we try to so-called open up the country to try and get the economy back a couple of months ago, particularly in the southern states that were variable in how well they abided by the principles of the public health measures of opening the economy, um, we got into trouble and we had cases each day that peaked at around 70,000 and now have come down to about 40,000. The reason I give you those numbers is that if you're going to enter the challenging season of the fall and the winter, where some things, if not many things, will have to be done indoors rather than outdoors, you really intensify the problem, as well as the fact that we have to deal with an influenza season, as you mentioned. So I would have hoped that when we go into the fall season, we would have had a baseline that was really much, much lower than 40,000 cases. So even though if you look at the map of the country, there are some areas of the country that are doing quite well. But as a nation, we're very diverse. We have multiple regions, multiple um, uh, climates, demographies, and things like that, that there are areas of the country now that we're starting to see the upticks, maybe from people coming back from vacation, maybe from the college students, maybe from the post-Labor uh, Day weekend. But we're seeing in certain parts of the country upticks in test positivity, which is generally a bad prognostic sign for you're then going to start seeing more cases, more hospitalizations, and then the late effects of perhaps even more deaths. So we have got to now, and I want to be clear with you, because whenever I say this, people sometimes misinterpret that I'm saying we've got to lock down the country. We're not talking about shutting down anything. We're talking about taking a very prudent careful approach to reopening the economy by the common five or six things, wearing masks uniformly, avoiding crowds, keeping distance, doing things outdoors absolutely much more preferentially than indoors, and washing your hands frequently. It sounds like rather simple things, but they do have a major impact on whether you can get those surges to come down. So your question about the flu season, we now have enough flu vaccine to vaccinate almost 200 million people. Everybody six months or older should get a flu shot. And if we do and abide by those public health measures that I just mentioned, we might mitigate well the flu season. And let me show you why I think that's a possibility. Our colleagues in the Southern Hemisphere, in Australia, South Africa and Argentina, particularly in Australia, 
because they were careful about mask using distance crowds as they entered their winter, which is April to the end of August. So they just finishing their winter now. They had almost a non-existent flu season. The first time in memory that they had such a low flu season. And the reason is they abided by the public health measures that I just mentioned. So as we enter the flu season, get your flu shot and please pay attention to those very simple public health recommendations. That, that segues into a question we have from a, a friend of Wired, uh, Bill Gates, uh, you know, who I know you've, you're, you're familiar with. Um, he thanks Good you friend. for your leadership. Yeah. And he, he has a question for you. He says, uh, Bill says, my question is whether or not you're seeing seasonality with COVID as we see in other coronaviruses or seasonal influenza, right? And you, and you talked about how the Southern Hemisphere has, has dealt with it through their winter. Um, do we, we haven't seen that or have we, uh, you know, seeing how the numbers worked? And if not, why do you think that is? No, the numbers, the numbers are telling us just the opposite of that. Because remember, as we went from the late winter, early spring, of March, April, May, there was a question that as we get into the hotter months of June, July, and August, would there in fact be a substantial diminution of infections in our climate zone, namely the Northern Hemisphere? And it's very clear we didn't see that. There clearly is seasonality of the common cold coronaviruses, but right now, we should not have and did not, and the, I think the numbers proved it, that we did not see a major dip in the infection as we went through the summer. Because just like I told you, we had those surges in Florida, which was hot and humid during the summer months. And that's when they went up to the really big surge that accounted for the countrywide uh, numbers of 70,000 new infections throughout the country as we were in the summer months. So the answer to my good friend Bill's question is, we've not seen seasonality with this particular outbreak. So I understand with a novel virus, uh, advice changes as we learn more about it. But sometimes, in this case, it's difficult to nail down what we know at a given moment. Um, can you put the rest of the confusion about whether the virus spreads by aerosols around in the air as opposed to droplets that are propelled and fall to the ground or surfaces? As you know, the CDC said yes, and then they walked it back. Um, people, some people thought politics might be involved. Can you tell us what the answer to that is in terms of aerosols sure. and what that means for us as we try to avoid getting infected? Right. Okay. So there are a couple of things that have helped to clarify the answer to that question partially, but I think satisfactorily, and then a part that we can answer. First of all, when you talk about aerosol, classically that means something that comes from the respiratory tract and instead of in the droplets of a certain size, fall to the ground within a few feet. That accounts for the six foot distance recommendation. There are particles that are small enough or in an area when you look at the dynamics of airflow, they don't just drop. They hang around for a while, for several seconds to minutes, so that you don't have that kind of uh, dynamic where all you need to do is to stay distant. That's one of the reasons why we're going to get to in a second why it's important to wear masks, particularly and even when you are indoors. So the idea that there are aerosols, when you talk to the aerosol physicists who study this, there seems to be no question that an element of the transmission is aerosol. When you look at some of the epidemiological studies, such as in a restaurant where you have people seated far away from each other who could not have been in the range of a droplet that is going to be close enough to transmit, who've actually gotten infected, which is epidemiological strong suggestion that there is aerosol spread. So the answer, I'll, I'll make it a two-part answer to your question. The mm -hmm. first, do I believe that there is aerosol that is transmitting as part of the transmission? 
And my answer is yes, based on what we know about aerosol physics, and we're learning from the physicists who do this full time, as well as epidemiological data. What we don't know is to what proportion of what level of impact aerosol plays in transmission. It is likely that it is not the major form of transmission, mm -hmm. that the major form is still that droplet type of transmission from person to person in close contact. But the data that I see get me feel, I believe pretty confidently that there is some element. I can't tell you if it's 2%, 5%, 10%, but there is an element of aerosol transmission, which I don't think is the dominant form of transmission. So, so I take it you're not going to a bar anytime soon. Well, no, and I'm glad, Stephen, that you brought that up, because when you're talking about in a crowded place where people tend not to wear masks and you're indoors, that's a perfect setup for any kind of transmission, larger droplet transmission, as well as aerosol. And in fact, when you look at the hot spots of transmission, when you've seen people crowded at bars with no masks, that's when you start to see the uptick of test positivity, which leads to increased cases and then increased hospitalizations. And then the vulnerable people who get serious illness get in trouble. So let's talk about vaccines for a while. So we have four vaccines now that are in phase three, which means these randomized clinical tests with tens of thousands of human volunteers. Um, but while the speed is unprecedented, it's also causing some disquiet. Like the name of the program itself is Operation Warp Speed, which is named after a make-believe form of transportation that violates the laws of physics, right? I think you have <laughs> on this there. So, so I, I'm totally in on vaccines in general, and God knows I am desperate for protection, but I confess that personally I'm among the people who the polls say is now over half the population that fears that the first vaccine coming along will be released because of maybe political concerns rather than science. Yeah. Is that yeah. fear reasonable? Well, the fear is understandable. But if I give you the facts, I would hope that you would see that in many respects it's not reasonable, but it's understandable based on sometimes confusing messages that go out there. So, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to try and clarify it. So first of all, getting back to what you said, Stephen, I agree. When I heard the word warp speed, I kind of winced because that can suggest to some irresponsible speed, but it's not. So the time element of how we were able to get to phase three trials that you mentioned, there are now actually five candidates that are in phase three. One is on hold because of an adverse event that has taken place in the UK. But let's say four that are operational. The reason we were able to get to that in a matter of months, as opposed to years, is a reflection of the extraordinary technological advances in vaccinology that have allowed us to do that, to go from the sequence of a virus on January the 10th, to starting work on a new type of a platform, to going into a phase one trial in 60 some odd days instead of a few years, to going into a phase three trial six months later that we started the first ones on July 27th, was not compromising safety. It was not compromising scientific integrity. It was a reflection of scientific advances coupled with financial risks. So what do I say, what do I mean when I say financial risks? So in general vaccinology, when the companies do this, they cautiously do one step after the other, after the other in sequence. We are doing things in parallel. So before we have the answer to A, we invest the money in B. And before we get the answer to B, we invest money in C. That's called at risk. Again, a bad terminology. Because it isn't risk to the patient, it's risk to the money. 
so that you start preparing for a trial long before the previous trial is proven to be successful. You start making doses of vaccine before you even know it works. So if it does work, you save months. If it doesn't work, you lose a lot of money. And the mm-hmm. thought being that the federal government is saying, we'll take the chance of a financial loss in order to get the process to be done in a speedy but measured way so that you don't cut corners on safety and you don't cut corners on scientific integrity. That's the speed. But there's another question that, well, I know you want to ask it, so let me go in, is that what about the decision of whether or not it's safe and effective? The big elephant in the room, Stephen, is is there political influence saying, get something out that isn't necessarily safe or that isn't necessarily effective? The way the system is set up, there is independent bodies that have access to the data that no one else has access to. And they make the decision based on the scientific data, whether the vaccine is safe and effective. That's called a data and safety monitoring board. That is a board made up of clinicians, vaccinologists, statisticians, ethicists. They are the only ones in the form of the unblinded, as it were, statistician, who intermittently look at the data, and they can come to any of a number of conclusions. They can say at a predetermined time, I'm looking at the data, it hasn't met the specifications in the protocol for efficacy. So continue the study for another X number of months. Or it can look at the data and say, my goodness, there are more infections in the vaccine limb of the protocol than the placebo limb. You better stop the study because it's dangerous. Or they'll say, we've looked at the data, and in fact, the vaccine is indeed providing the kind of protection that's statistically significant. So now the company gets access to the data. They go to the FDA, and the FDA examines it independent scientists examine it together with their advisory committee, which is another independent committee. And then they make a recommendation whether they have an emergency use authorization or a BLA, which is a biological license application. Now, if they're tried to be an end run around that politically, that will be so transparent because all of that information will be available to the scientific community, to people like myself and all of my scientific colleagues. So there's a lot of fail-safe issues in there that are going to prevent going too fast, going too recklessly, or doing something prematurely. So when is your expectation that this is going to happen? Some of them, you know, the optimistic, maybe over-optimistic uh, uh, expectations we've been hearing from the administration is in a few weeks in October. Um, yeah. You know, maybe we'll start getting inoculated uh, before the end of the year. Um, well, other people, you know, in the government are saying, really, not until next summer can we really expect that to happen. What's your guess? No, no, no. That's Stephen. I'm glad you brought that up because there's some there's some confusing messages there. Let let me march through it sure. with you if you'll allow me to do it. So right now, with the the vaccines that are in advanced phase three clinical trial, there's a lot of people in those trials. I mean, the Moderna trial has 30,000 people. The Pfizer trial has 44,000. The Janssen trial has 60,000. So there are a lot of testing going on there. We're projecting that given the level of infection that we're seeing in the sites in this country, and in some cases internationally, where infection is ongoing, that my projection and that of my colleagues is that it is likely that we will know whether we have a safe and effective vaccine somewhere around November and December. Is it conceivable that that might be before then, namely October? It is conceivable, I believe unlikely, But I wouldn't be that surprised if it were, because the the answer to the trial 
is based on how many infections take place in the context of the trial and whether the vaccine is quite protective versus obviously the placebo, which you wouldn't expect to be protective. So let's assume that we get an answer in November and December. As I mentioned a little while ago, the government has already invested in making hundreds of millions of doses already. They're working on it now. So there will be available at the end of the year in December, you know, about 100 million doses. As you get into January, February, March, April, it'll be up to 700 million doses by the end of April. So if we have, if, because remember, we got to prove it first, but if we have a successful right. vaccine at the end of the year, we would be able to start administering vaccine to the people who are at the highest priority, which is determined by an independent board. By the time you get to April, you will have enough vaccine from all of the companies to be able to administer essentially to everybody in the country. Practically speaking, when do we think we actually will logistically get the vaccine into people who want to get the vaccine or who might want to wait and see how the trials go? Practically speaking, Stephen, it likely will be the second, third quarter of 2021. But the beginning of the administration of the vaccines likely could take place at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Okay, we have an audience question from uh, Steve Stoneburn. Uh, were viewers well served or poorly served by the COVID Q&A at last night's debate? Um, well, <laughs> I think that the viewers of that would likely not really have a clear cut picture of what was going on. I, I don't I don't think I mean, I don't want to start getting into sound bites, but that was an unusual experience, that debate. Was your you know, your name was invoked several times. Were you comfortable right. with the characterization of the president talked to you at one, about you? He said at one point you congratulated him for saving, you know, uh, 100,000 lives by, you know, the limited uh, travel from China. Then he said that you changed your minds about masks. You said masks are not good. And then you said masks are good. Um, and he said to you specifically in that. Do you want to right. clarify anything? Now, I, I, I could I could clarify that. Um, but let me first say that uh, you've probably heard me speak a lot, uh, Stephen, uh, you know, TV and radio and press. Um, sure. I must have said maybe several tens of thousands of times the importance <laughs> of wearing masks. It's like when people see me when I'm walking or running in the street with my wife and I have my mask on, they see me, they put their mask up because they yeah. know it's me. So I'm the mask guy. All right. I don't think yeah. there's any yeah. doubt about that. So if there was an interpretation that I'm not for masks, that's a misinterpretation, but let me get to your question. So there were two areas that were brought up. The first was the president said that um, when he shut down China, that he definitely saved a lot of infections here in the country. And he's absolutely correct that he made a decision to shut down travel to China. And that was a good decision that resulted in the saving of lives and the saving of infections. The issue with the mask is that when we in the beginning, and I'll say it now for the multiple time, I'll try to do it quickly. Back mm. in February, March, when there were very few infections in this country. There was a shortage of masks for the healthcare providers that needed it. Number one, we did not want to all of a sudden hoard masks and take it away from the people who were preparing for the onslaught of cases. Number two, the data of the efficacy of masks were not as clear then. Subsequently, studies have come out and experience from other countries have made it very clear that masks are effective. Number three, we found out that cotton cloth coverings were just as good 
as the surgical mask. And so what was taken off the table was the shortage. There's no longer a shortage of masks, number one. Number two, the data that show that mass works are now very, very clear. And number three, when we realized a very important epidemiological fact that 40 to 45 percent of the infections are without symptoms, people have no symptoms, so they don't know they're infected. And modeling shows that a substantial proportion of transmissions occur from person who is asymptomatic and doesn't know they're infected to an uninfected person. Therefore, everyone should assume that you might be infected. Therefore, Mm -hmm. we went from saying we really shouldn't be doing masks to absolutely people should be wearing masks. So that gets distorted because we acted according to the situation at the time. Early on, it wasn't a situation based on our knowledge that would have mandated or given us a strong indication for masks. Mm. Right now, let there be no confusion by anybody. You should be wearing a mask, keeping distance, avoiding crowds, doing things outdoor more than indoor, and washing your hands. I cannot be more clear than that. So how did you feel when the president sort of made fun of uh, uh, Vice President Biden for wearing a big mask? You know, I can't comment on that, Stephen. I just don't want to go there about critiquing the president of the United States. Okay. well, we have one more audience question I want to finish out on. It's a little different spin there. Um, Oscar Weinfurtner asks, what is a belief that you hold that many others don't appreciate yet? Uh, You know, uh, the belief that I hold that if we pull together as a nation in a unified way to address this outbreak by adhering to the prudent and careful public health principles that will allow us to continue to open up the economy and not shut down. We're saying not shut down, but continue to open up the economy in a careful, prudent way that this outbreak will end. We will get a vaccine. I spoke about that a few moments ago. And if we combine a vaccine with prudent public health measures, we can put this outbreak behind us. And that's the reason why we should not despair because despair makes you throw your hands up and say, it doesn't matter what I do, what's going to happen is going to happen. That is incorrect. It does matter what we do. And if we do it for a while longer, we will look behind us and the outbreak will be behind us, not among us. Well, I certainly hope you're right. And I thank you again for spending your time with us. I know you're a very busy guy. Um, Stay safe. Thank you very much, Stephen. Good to be with you. I am Andy Greenberg. I'm a senior writer with Wired, and I cover cybersecurity. And after that really excellent last interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci, our next panel is going to talk about a kind of pandemic within the pandemic, so to speak. Since since the spring, since this pandemic began, there has been a kind of uh, cybercrime wave. A group of bad actors online has taken advantage of the desperation surrounding this COVID-19 crisis and uh, use that desperation to launch all manner of fraud, even target medical facilities. And of one group um, known as the Cyber Threat Intelligence League has kind of heard the call for a new group of researchers that could respond to these threats. Um, and we have with us today um, three members of that group. Um, Oad Zadenberg is the founder of the CTI League. We also have with us Nate Warfield, who is a security researcher at Microsoft, and Mark Rogers, a VP of cybersecurity at Okta. And and Nate uh, and Mark are both founding members of this group as well. Now, I want to let OADS take the lead and tell us what is the CTI League and what is the kind of 
origin story briefly of this uh, group of cyber superheroes. Thank you, Andy. The CTI League is a global community aspired to protect the medical sector and the life-saving organization worldwide to create a safer cyberspace for them. Earlier this year, around February, I started to notice more and more threat actors leveraging the corona as a method, as a social engineering method, where they're trying to attack multiple actors worldwide. Back then, the virus was an unknown virus from China, and I didn't pay attention much to the virus. But then, when it became a world crisis, I was really afraid of the scenario of WannaCry, and I really afraid that this scenario will repeat itself. Around March, I remember a long night drive that I took from a dinner that I had with my family. It was the night before Israel entered to its first lockdown, and I said, I have to do something because now it's a real threat. Now, if any ransomware group would, would attack an hospital, it's going to end with people that is going to die. So I started to think about this community. Then, one day after, I saw the attack against the second biggest hospital in the Czech Republic. That was the trigger for me to stop sitting on the fence and start doing something. You know, the coronavirus is a war, but there are people around the world that are trying to leverage the crisis to gain some profit, whether they are private or they are state-sponsored, and they want to do harm for people. The equilibrium is very clear. If an hospital needs to fight ransomware and pay more money on uh, fighting cyber, on cyber security and cyber attack, it means that they pay less money for ventilators or co corona department. I sent a message from Nate Warfield that is here with us, and I said, hey, I thought in the last few days about a community, a Slack channel, when we can collaborate, we can share data worldwide and say, hey, we are here for you. If you are in medical facilities, no matter where, we are here for you to protect you. We want to reduce the level of threat to you. We want to neutralize cyber threats looking to harm you in this most sensitive time for the medical sector or to leverage the current crisis to, to gain some profit with scams on the darknet, for example. Together with Mark and Chris Myers that is not with us, we created the first global community ever that aspire to protect these organizations. At the first month, we crossed the 1,000 members of the league, and currently we are in the process of founding the CTI League as an organization that protect, for the long term, these organizations. As we keep growing, we understood this is a real threat. There are thousands of vulnerabilities in the networks of these organizations, and someone needs to supply the services from the initial part of prevention the attack, supporting them in mitigation of attack, and then neutralizing with law enforcement organizations worldwide to neutralize the threats. I really happy that in the city I live, there are more than 1,500 members worldwide from more than 80 countries. We cross barriers and silos over the industry and prove that we can be a community, effective community, that's doing some good in this sensitive and crisis time. Well, speaking about some very specific cyber attacks, just in the last few days, we saw this ransomware attack hit Universal Health Services, this network of 400 medical facilities across the United States with 90,000 employees uh, has been paralyzed by this cyber attack. Last week, we saw German prosecutors say that they're going to um, go after hackers on actual murder charges for the first time for a ransomware attack that caused the death of a woman in Dusseldorf. Um, I, you guys have told me that you don't want to talk about specific victims, which is understandable. There are sensitivities there in this kind of work. But I was hoping that you could speak about a kind of like, um, like, what are the sorts of threats that you have dealt with? How have you dealt with them? What are the kind of greatest hits of the CTI League? Maybe that's a question for, for Nate or Mark, if you want to jump in. Sure, I can jump in. Um, one of the things that I was most proud about uh, that we did back in June, um, there is a, a vulnerability that came out for a piece of uh, network equipment that runs along a lot of the hospitals and bank networks. Um, it's very expensive, very mission critical. Uh, so myself and a bunch of other members of the CTI League, uh, we saw this come out in, I think it was a Tuesday. 
Uh, it was right before the 4th of July weekend. So we just jumped onto it. We spent, we have, I think about eight of us worked the entire 4th of July weekend, uh, probably ruining a few barbecues for those in the United States that were looking to shoot off fireworks. But by the end of that weekend, we'd managed to notify about three or four dozen different hospitals and said, hey, you've got a, a device that's out there that can very quickly be turned into a, a pivot point to deploy ransomware inside your network. Um, it was a sort of a similar uh, category of vulnerability as was used against the TravelX um, um, credit card network back in uh, December of 2019. So it was a good feeling knowing that we'd, we'd gotten the word out to a few folks um, and we did see attacks uh, quite literally started, I think it was the Sunday or the Monday of that weekend. Um, so it was uh, minutes counted in this instance and I think we were, we were able to do a really good job. Yeah. Um, if I can build on, I was gonna say, if I could build on what Nate said, um, we're also seeing attacks across the entire spectrum. I mean, it's almost fair to say that this is a cyber pandemic because the bad guys, um, criminal actors, have always exploited big events. And there is no bigger event than a global pandemic. And so they're leveraging every aspect of this that they can. They're sending out documents. They're sending out phishing emails. They're sending out uh, tailored malware. And we see everything from ridiculously simple emails with no attachments that just try to coerce people through to highly sophisticated pieces of malware with multiple chains of exploitation to try and, and compromise infrastructure. It's, it's all going on. And it kind of makes it difficult as a, a defense team because right, where do you spend your time and resources? And so we've had to subdivide into a quite a large number of groups to tackle all of these different issues which are then themselves exacerbated by the fact that because everybody's at home, you don't have the normal protections that you would have from being inside a company. You can't go to your IT team or your security team as easily, and triaging a laptop that's been infected is now exponentially harder. Yeah, I mean, at the beginning of this pandemic, I, I, I remember seeing you quoted, Mark, as saying that you saw a level of phishing you had never seen before. Uh, and as this, as COVID-19 becomes less of a kind of news item and more of just a basic fact of life, has that tailed off? Or are we still seeing that same level of, of COVID-19 related cybercrime? It's still, still pretty much there. Um, whether or not it's growing, I, I can't say. I mean, I, I think it's it's probably it's holding steady but th there's nothing new about this if you dial back to any major event like for example if you look back at the sochi olympics you'll see that there was a massive fishing campaign or series of fishing campaigns associated with that because bad guys recognize that wherever there's an absence of information or whether there's an interesting fact that people might want to get what they do is they use that as a lure to try and pull in uh, people. They send documents that allege to fill the gap or that try to tempt people with information they might be missing, and, and they go after it. And so as long as the need for information is out there, the bad guys will be exploiting it. Well, um, as this threat evolves, and um, hopefully as COVID-19 no longer becomes that lure, I wanted to give each of you just a chance very briefly, because we're running out of time here, to talk about what do, you, what do you think is the next big threat? What is the thing that keeps each of you up at night with your kind of like very unique visibility into all of these very dangerous phenomena? I'll go ahead and start. Um, I think what keeps me awake at night is after 25, 30 years of InfoSec, it doesn't seem like the problem is uh, really getting any better. Um, I mean, we've made some great advances in system security and endpoint security, um, you know, from when I started in this in the late 90s to what we have today, like the ability to to catch people has improved drastically. The problem is we're still seeing vulnerabilities that are quite literally like 90s era vulnerabilities. Um, that coupled with the ease at which attackers are sort of leveraging some of the defensive tool sets that we use to you know, ascertain security for a corporate network, these are quickly getting spun around and used by attackers. So the bar has been raised for defenders on one side, the attackers are using some of these same tools to raise their own bar and make their like total career, return on investment for the malware they have to develop is, is much better when they can just use commodity tools. Um, and that's we always feel one step behind the eight ball. And that's, that's what keeps me awake at night. Oh, what, do you what want to say something awake? about what... Please, Mark, go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry. I was going to say, is what keeps me awake at night, it's similar to what Nate said, is I feel like we 
spend too much time focusing on the highly specific. So we've built some great defenses in very specific areas. We're evolving things like identity at a furious rate. Um, but at the same time, we've got companies that aren't able to apply patches, that don't have the resources to do it. And the biggest one that worries me is that we still don't have good cybersecurity or even cyber training in our schools. And so kids are coming out of, uh, of high school without the necessary knowledge and skills to adequately identify and protect themselves against this threat. So essentially, we're releasing a new generation of victims each time we push it out. If we instead taught our kids to recognize things like phishing attacks, taught our kids about some of the dangers on the internet, we would not only make them safer, but we'd make our nation safer. Well, Owad, since we're running out of time, can I just, I want to give you the chance to have the last word and say what you're maybe most worried about. But also, I wanted to ask a more general question, if you could maybe answer this as well. Can the CTI League continue once this crisis is over? You know, there has always been this kind of siloing of threat intelligence, a competition among researchers to be the first to find something. When the pandemic is over, can the CTI League continue to be this kind of kumbaya, um, you know, cooperative movement? So that's exactly what I wanted to answer. As I said before, we are in the process of funding the league, the CTI League, as a non-profit organization that would be able to supply the assistance for the medical sector and life-saving organization for the long term. You know, when we created the league, we really focused on corona crisis-related um, attacks, and we really focused on protecting hospitals. When we continue to grow, we saw more and more attacks that we need to handle with. We started with the hospitals, but when? But then we expand ourselves to the life-saving organization, for example, the emergency sector. Now we want to keep the protection that we're going to offer because they are highly vulnerable and nobody in the world protected them before the way we wish to do. Global and community to rely on the community to work side by side with people that I, as an Israeli, can't even visit the country and to work together as one unit to protect them. So what keeps me up uh, at night and as Wire 25 for me, kind of Hakula, what keeps me up for night is working on funding the CTI League as an organization that can supply this assistance for the long term to reduce the level of threat to this organization, to neutralize cyber threats, both looking to harm the medical sector and the life-saving organization, or to exploit the current COVID-19 pandemic, to support the law enforcement organization that we have amazing collaborations with them worldwide against threats that are a danger for the public safety and be ready for the next event. For example, Mark, told, uh, Mark spoke about the Olympic Games. We saw what happened two years ago in the Olympic Games, and this is the event that all the world participate in. The City League would have an intervention team that is ready for this event, and we will continue to expand ourselves to protect more organizations worldwide, pro bono, only to do some good in the world. Well, I wish you luck in that very important mission. Um, Nate, Mark, Owad, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your excellent work. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, my name is Lily Hayne Newman. I'm a security reporter with Wired. Thank you for joining us. I'm here with Maddie Stone. She's a security researcher at Google's Project Zero, and she studies bugs in software, vulnerabilities, flaws in software that are actively being exploited or sort of weaponized by hackers out in the world. Hi, Maddie, how are you doing? Hey, Lily, I'm doing well. <laughs> So I think the first thing we need to talk about in order to understand what you work on and where you work at Project Zero is to talk about what is a zero day vulnerability. This is a phrase that people may have heard, uh, but it can be kind of confusing. So a zero day vulnerability is one of those vulnerabilities or issues in software that the defenders 
don't yet know about, and thus it's not fixed. There's nothing in place to prevent it being exploited by people who want to attack or cause harm. And so, for example, like you might get updates on your phone or Microsoft or Windows, any of those things that say, hey, take a new security update. Um, and they usually, if you go and read into all the notes, it tells you all the vulnerabilities they're fixing that month. Prior to those being fixed, they're generally considered zero days because they're not fixed and people didn't know to watch out for them. So they're not the sort of mass exploited types of things. They're not the spam you're getting into um, your email boxes all the time. They're really targeted, sophisticated types of attacks because it takes a lot of expertise to find them um, and to exploit them. So they're usually only used to target, you know, high profile, um, highly valuable targets such as political dissidents, age, uh, human rights activists, journalists, things like that. Right. So zero day vulnerabilities, they're very uh, valuable to attackers or they're, you know, they're trying to keep them secret for this reason you're saying. It's not about targeting everyone. It's about keeping it to yourself so you can use it when you want it. And one other thing I wanted to say when you were talking about, uh, you know, hearing about patches that come out or software updates that come out, uh, those are things that aren't zero days, as you were saying, because zero days are bugs that defenders have had zero days to fix, right? Mm -hmm. So it's exactly like that, so it's that timing. Yep. So it's only before there's no fix, there's not knowledge of them, things like that. Right. So why does Google have Project Zero? You know, there's these vulnerabilities out there. There's already companies trying to find bugs in their own software, right? Like, why do we need uh, another group that's doing this watch out or look out for more vulnerabilities? Um, well, to start, Project Zero was formed back in 2014, and it really came from Google's drive for it was also that, you know, Chrome and this other software runs on other platforms. And insecurities in things such as Chrome running on Windows or Chrome running on iPhone or Flash that runs on websites that you display in Chrome, those vulnerabilities then affected Chrome users. And so Project Zero was formed to help find and fix the vulnerabilities in all this other client software. Um, and we do it for Chrome and Android as well um, and other Google products to fix that because inherently all of these things we use on computers and phones work together. So there can only be as secure as the other things you're using or running to. Um, and from that point, then we've continued to grow and push and try to push um, new sort of standards for information security, such as when the team was started, um, there was not a deadline or sort of the expectation that vendors, you know, the people writing, selling the software or hardware would actually fix vulnerabilities if an external person worked or reported it to them. And so now there's this general convention that you report it, and 90 days later, you can you as an external reporter or researcher of the vulnerability can go public with it. So it puts this emphasis of the developers of you should probably patch this and help protect your users and fix the vulnerability because otherwise 90 days later, it's going to go public and you're going to have to explain, oh, yeah, we decided not to fix this. Y'all are all still um, at risk. Right. And Project Zero really, along with other groups, but Project Zero really, you know, took a strong stand on wanting to push that urgency, right, about people fixing things once they're found. Um, in terms of your work, which sort of goes this extra step to say, OK, we're finding a lot of things, but what about things we know are being actively exploited by attackers? Why is it important to study those bugs in particular, along with all the other great work Project Zero does? Yeah, so as a whole, the majority of our team is focusing and putting themselves in the hat of an attacker. They're looking for vulnerabilities in any sort of client-facing side software, iOS, Android, Chrome, Microsoft, uh, Safari, Firefox, et cetera, anything that's really on the user versus a company side. Um, whereas my job is to then focus on 
what are the attackers actually using against people? And the reason for that is that we always want to make sure that our research and our ability to try and act and compete with the attackers is based in the reality of what they're actually doing and what they care about. So sometimes in the industry, we use this term of private state of the art versus public state of the art, meaning the attackers in the private state of the art, they know what their actual state of the art is, what challenges they're facing, what tools they have, what expertise they have. But we on the defender side really only know what's public um, and have to try and figure out what the attackers are doing. So anytime an attacker's zero day exploit is found and detected, that's their failure case. They did not intend for it to be, be discovered and for us to know what they're doing. So we capitalize on that, learning as much as we can about what is the vulnerability um, they're actually exploiting and how might they have found out? What type of tools were they using? What type of exploitation methodologies they were using? Um, and different things like that, because then we can take that knowledge and apply it for more systemic fixes in the software rather than just a single bug. Because if we're just fixing each single vulnerability as we find it, it's a lot of whack-a-mole. And the attackers only have to find one vulnerability to have a successful exploit, but we as defenders have to defend them all. So a better return on investment is really studying it and figuring out, okay, they know about this exploit method and they're using it. Can we break this exploit methodology as a whole? Can we fix a vulnerability class as a whole instead of that single vulnerability that we now know um, they found? I like what you've said in the past that you uh, don't want these cyber weapons or these exploit tools to be democratized, you know, that your work is about trying to sort of nip things in the bud, just as you're describing. Uh, we have one really quick uh, viewer question from Howard Fox. He asked, is it a hindrance or a help to work within a large matrixed organization with billions of users? So does it, you know, does Google scale and reach help or hinder your research? Um, for my research here on Project yeah. Zero, I think in general, um, it helps because one, um, Google has actually been very good at letting us act as external researchers. We are able to report to Google and Chrome with the exact same manner, the exact same deadlines, um, not always the best public press in the same way that we do for external companies. But then at the same time, we have access to a lot of resources. Like we have plenty of access to technology to build new tools to try and find vulnerabilities, to build new um, research, new detection methods for how might we um, try and find new vulnerabilities. And, you know, I'm not really making Google any money, yet they still pay my salary and allow me to do this research that is not always going to be successful and has a risk. So I think. Overall, it's a net benefit since, you know, I have a job and get to do this work I care about. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us, Maddie. Uh, we hope Google keeps paying you and please keep burning zero days. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. <laughs>
In the U.S., you vote on 20, 40, sometimes as many as 90. And for that, we need computers for the speed and accuracy. Humans just can't do the job as fast or as accurately. And then the second reason, so we need equipment to count ballots. And then we also need equipment to help many millions of voters produce their paper ballot because many millions of voters can't read 10-point font or fill out tiny bubbles. And that's another area where we need voting equipment. So you asked, you know, what does voting works do? Um, well, who makes these machines, right? These are the foundation of democracy. They're the, the operating system of democracy. Uh, voting works is the only nonprofit election equipment maker. And uh, we think that elections are the foundation of democracy and that foundation should be publicly owned. It's for us a question of trust and transparency. So what are some other uh, efforts this year or things that are going to be different in the 2020 election uh, that are sort of other movements in this direction of uh, verifiability uh, and accountability? I think the most important election security story of 2020 is not the one you're thinking of. Uh, it's risk-limiting audits. And I know that's a mouthful, but I want to explain it because it is a giant success of election security, and we should be talking about it more. And that is, uh, I just mentioned, we need computers to tabulate our votes, right? We need that for security. Uh, sorry, we need it for accuracy and speed. But should we really trust the computer to tell us who won the election? And of course, the answer is no. We need to audit it in some way. And we want the, the speed and accuracy of computers, and we want the trust and verifiability of a multi-partisan group of humans checking individual ballots. Risk limiting audits square that circle. They allowed us to get both. The computers do the tabulation quickly and accurately, and then humans get together and through a rigorous statistical method, look at a small sample of those ballots to confirm the work of the tabulators. A state can typically do this in one or two days, so before results are certified, and get a much higher level of uh, uh, security and integrity for that election. The, the, the crazy thing about risk limiting audits is we haven't done this kind of rigorous statistical stuff. Uh, we, have ne we never did it until 2017. That's the first time that happened, which means this election, 2020, is the first time we're running this kind of rigorous statistical audit in a presidential election in the US. And the wonderful news is that we're expect to see five to eight states this year, uh, up from zero four years ago, do this kind of rigorous statistical audit. And uh, Voting Works is really, really proud to be uh, uh, making the software that's going to run almost all of those audits uh, for states this year. Yeah, well, up from zero, it's a really impressive number, and <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be a big contribution in this election when there's so much going on, we could say. So on that note, uh, you know, I think we should talk about vote by mail a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, we're just hearing so much uh, conflicting information about vote by mail, uh, and absentee by mail voting and all these different phrases, uh, including uh, in the presidential debate last night. Uh, can you talk a little bit about fraud in vote by mail? What, what's the concern there? Yeah. So the bottom line is that if you talk to election security experts, including me, but not just including me, uh, vote by mail fraud is simply not a major concern. If you look at the data, uh, it happens occasionally. It usually gets caught. It doesn't happen at the scale that would ever come close to impacting uh, the outcome of an election. And so it, it's this, this discussion of vote by mail fraud is much ado about nothing. I think the more important conversation about vote by mail is how COVID has obviously forced states to significantly step up their game on vote by mail. And for many states, that's a pretty significant chance, significant change. And that change means we're going to see some hiccups, right? Expect to see some hiccups around this, just like you're seeing hiccups in every other aspect of your life around COVID-19. But the thing to remember is the election officials around the country from both parties are working so incredibly hard to make this work. They're the true heroes here. Uh, just remember that when you're criticizing elections or how they're run, like 
they're, they're your friends, they're your neighbors, they're, they're helping democracy, and they're working seven days a week, long days to make this work. There will be some small hiccups, but vote by mail is safe. If that's how you want to vote, request your ballot, vote at home, send it in. If you prefer to drop it off, if your state allows that, go ahead and drop it off. Do it as early as you can. That will help your election officials you know, process all the ballots in states where they're allowed to process them early. Uh, that's how what you can do to help. And if you want to vote in person, do that too. Uh, sorry, don't do that too. Do that or vote by mail. Don't do both. Uh, and uh, come in, vote, wear a mask, uh, socially distance, follow the instructions, uh, make sure your voice is, is heard. And don't worry about vote by mail fraud. It's not a significant concern. And to your point about all the hard work that election officials put in, what if and when there's a delay in getting results uh, on election day and after election day, what should we assume is happening during that time? You know, is that all election officials just like forging all the ballots and going on vacation or what's <laughs> going to be happening in those weeks? Now, first of all, election officials aren't going to be going on vacation for, you know, probably late December between all the work they're doing, because what they're going to do after Election Day is what they've done every year, which is canvas, make sure they got all the ballots, make sure all the ballots are counted, make sure that if there's any close election, they follow any auditing procedures they have. For some of the states, they're going to be running those risk limiting audits we talked about. And so uh, the thing to understand is while we are accustomed to election results declared on election night, although... As we know, it's not, not all the time, right? Election 2000 was one recent example where the result wasn't known on election night. Uh, the official results have never been known until three weeks after the election, the time it takes to make sure all the ballots are counted, including military ballots that sometimes come in a little bit later, right? But also including vote-by-mail ballots that are coming in a couple days after the election in states where you're allowed to send them up until the day of the election. These are valid votes, and we should count them all. And it might take a few days. And because there's so much more vote by mail this year, uh, there might be enough unknown on election night because those ballots are still coming in and being counted that maybe we won't declare a winner on election night. And that's OK. That's not any different than anything we've ever done before. It's just we have a little bit more vote by mail. And so getting those votes counted will take a few more days. And that's OK. But your election officials are not going to be on vacation for a while. They got work to do. Yeah. Definitely not. My last question for you, Ben, is, you know, why is misinformation or all this confusion about the voting process so problematic? And why is it so important for us to talk about? So two days ago, it's really, it's a great question. It's a really important question. Two days ago, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security issued a warning about election security and integrity. And it wasn't about hacked voting machines. And it wasn't about vote by mail. It was specifically about disinformation that reduces people's trust in election integrity. And the reason that's important is because democracy only works if we believe in it. it ha you have to run an election well, but if the people don't believe in the outcome of an election, it's a problem. And so the biggest attack and the biggest concern I have this year is not around any of this vote by mail fraud, that isn't the problem, hacked voting machines, which we should be worried about, but also there's no evidence it's happening. The biggest concern I have is that a lot of well-meaning folks out there who care about democracy are going to see an alarmist story on their Twitter feed or in their Facebook feed, or I don't, I don't think they happen on Instagram, but maybe on Instagram too. And they're going to say, I need to tell my friends about this. This is important. I'm going to retweet or share. And in the process, become an unwitting participant in this misinformation game of reducing people's trust in an election outcome. Please register to vote, vote, vote early if you can, but don't amplify messages that reduce people's trust in elections. Because if you do, if we lose faith in democracy, we lose democracy. All right, it's a chilling warning. Thank you so much for joining us, Ben. Thanks, Lily. Great to chat. Hello, my name is Rhett Elaine. I'm an associate professor of physics at Southeastern Louisiana University and a frequent contributor to Wired. I'm here today with Dr. Lisa Piccarillo, 
an assistant professor of mathematics at MIT, where she specializes in the field of topology. Her research focuses on the interaction between four-manifold four topology and knot theory. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. It's nice to talk to you. Great. Good. Thanks for being here. So let's start off with a question about, maybe you've answered this quite a few times uh, in your recent years, but what would you say is the difference between knot theory and topology? Yeah, so knot theory is the study of knots. So uh, what's a knot? A knot is what you get if you go down in the basement and you find your extension cord, and uh, it's probably like a disaster if it's been down there for a while, and that's, that's fine. Uh, just plug the ends together. So now it's a disaster, but it's also a circle. That's a knot. And in knot theory, we study things like if you take yours and your best friend takes theirs, uh, is it possible without unplugging the ends to make your knot look exactly like your friend's knot? So that's what knot theory cares about. In topology, we care about spaces that are locally really boring. So a boring space is something like a line that's a one-dimensional space or a piece of paper that's two-dimensional or like the room you're sitting in, which is three-dimensional. Uh, so those spaces are boring, and we pay attention to spaces that are locally boring, but globally more interesting. So if you looked at, for example, the skin on an orange, um, that's a space that I think of as two-dimensional, because if you zoom way in, it looks flat, like a piece of paper. You can't really tell it's curved. But globally, something more interesting is going on. Uh, so that's what topology studies. Okay, so I know that really we want to talk about this Conway problem, this Conway knot. And I, in order to understand that, we have to, people talk about the term sliceness of a knot. So can you give an explanation of a sliceness of a knot? Yeah, so first let me tell you what it means for a knot to bound a disc in three dimensions. Um, so let's suppose you took a, a tablecloth, a round tablecloth, and maybe it has a lace border on it. So that lace border, that's gonna be a knot, right? It's like a circle sitting in three-dimensional space. That's what a knot is. And when the tablecloth's on the table, it's easy to see that that circle looks kind of boring. It bounds a disc. It's the boundary of this tablecloth. Okay, so that's a boring knot, and it bounds a disc in three space. Now, let's suppose dinner's over, and you crumple up the tablecloth, and you throw it in the hamper. And then you use your x-ray vision to look at the hamper and look just at the lace. Um, it's going to look very messy. Um, it's no longer just like a boring circle. It looks crazy. Uh, but I claim that that knot, it still bounds a disc in three-dimensional space because it still bounds the tablecloth, like the tablecloth is in the hamper. So a question you can ask is, does a knot bound a disc in three-dimensional space? And that's maybe the first question of all of knot theory. And that's not sliceness. Uh, sliceness is whether or not bounds a disc in four-dimensional space. So same question, but now I'm asking, can you find a tablecloth that you're not as the boundary of, but I'm going to let that tablecloth use an, a little bit of extra space if it needs to. So not just in three dimensions, as many dimensions as you want, or are we defining this to just deal realistic three dimensions? Or four dimensions? Oh, okay, so, but you can do more. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, yeah, but it won't be very interesting. <laughs> now, I, I will let me point out, I know that this is complicated stuff, and you're trying to describe these very complicated ideas in two, three-minute segments, and, and that is really tough. It's sort of like uh, haiku, right? Um, but, but with that in mind, you are known for solving this Conway knot problem, so could you give an explanation of the Conway knot problem? Sure. Um, so the Conway knot is this knot that John Conway um, sort of dreamt up, and it's got some funny properties. Um, and the problem is, uh, is it slice? Yes or no? And then, and then you figure that out. Yeah, it's not slice. Okay. <laughs> so what 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 was a big insight that allowed you to solve this problem that no one had solved? It's a decades old problem. So what was the, the change that made you able to solve that problem? Um, so I study these four dimensional spaces that are related to a knot. Um, in fact, like I'm more of a topologist than a knot theorist. So, so I'm interested in spaces. Um, but I, but I knew this fact, other people knew this fact too, which is that if you have two different knots that produce the same four dimensional space, 
then they're either both slice or they're both not slice. Um, so people want to know if the Conway knot is slice or not, but for whatever reason, the Conway knot is sort of pathologically difficult to work with. Uh, so the, the insight of my work is that, well, I won't work with the Conway knot because it's hard. I'll build another knot that shares the same space as it and try to study the other knot. If I can show that knot's not slice, then the Conway knot can't be slice. So, I mean, we don't have a, a bunch of time left. I want to get to the really important question that I want to talk about, and that this is really abstract stuff. But do you think that in, in both high school and in college and graduate school that, that abstract math should be part of everyone's education or should just certain people study abstract math? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I think that... <laughs> No, not everybody should study abstract math. It's sort of like studying literature. Like, if you love it, then you should study it. But it's not important that everybody in the world uh, be able to prove that root 2 is irrational. Um, however... And do you think that everyone should have some understanding of, of the basic ideas, though? Or do you think it, they shouldn't even look at it? Well... I think what's important is that is it maybe that people get some idea of what abstract math is all about because the math that's currently taught in schools is very computational. Um, you you do a lot of routines. You take a derivative or you uh, multiply fractions, um, and that's not what mathematicians do at all. Uh, what we really do is we try to make careful, rigorous arguments about straightforward objects, and I think it is a really different flavor than the math you learn in, even in high school. Um, I didn't learn that abstract math was like that until college, and most people, like, <laughs> they're done with math by college. They don't want any more of that. So uh, yeah. I think it would be good if we could give a flavor of, of what being a mathematician is all about uh, a bit earlier in our educations. Yeah, I think that's a, probably a good idea, too. So, well, Lisa, thank you very much for joining me and having a discussion about math. I really enjoyed it, and it was great to have you on. Hey everybody, welcome. My name is Alan Henry. I'm the service editor here at Wired. Uh, I am happily joined by Patrice Peck, aka Speak Patrice, uh, accomplished journalist with over a decade of experience in elevating and amplifying underrepresented and underreported stories. Uh, her work has been published in the New York Times and BuzzFeed, Ebony, Vogue, Elle, the list goes on. But today we're here to talk to her about her incredibly important newsletter, uh, Coronavirus News for Black Folks, which aims to speak directly to the black community, uh, a community already disproportionately affected by the pandemic, but with information and advice that we can't uh, get in traditional media. Patrice, thanks for being here. Thanks for having uh, me. Of course. Uh, so let's start with a pretty standard question. Uh, what inspired you to start the Coronavirus for Black Folks, uh, Coronavirus News for Black Folks newsletter? Sure. So my, back, my educational background is in um, Black Studies. I got um, my undergraduate um, degree in Black Studies at Amherst College, and I'm also a Black person. I have the lived experience. Um, and so in early, I want to say late February, that's when I started to really follow and track any news that was coming up, out about the coronavirus. And once I realized that people with pre-existing medical conditions were more likely um, or at a higher risk to suffer severe illness from coronavirus, that's when I realized, okay, this virus is going to really devast excuse me, devastate the black community because, because of anti-black systemic racism, there is an overwhelming amount of pre-existing pre medical conditions in the black community. Um, and I also realized just as a journalist that because a lot of publications within the black press um, have shuttered or folded or downsized um, drastically, again, because of um, systemic racism and just the, the shifting of the media landscape in general. I just knew that we needed like a hub for any news about the coronavirus as it relates directly to black people. 
Yeah, so you, and you mentioned the shuttering of a lot of traditional black media and black press, and and in your newsletter you mentioned that you wanted to fill some of those gaps in coverage that traditional media outlets have, and those blind spots that they traditionally take when they cover underrepresented communities. Uh, what do you think some of those blind spots are? Why do you think they have those gaps in coverage? Hmm. I honestly. <laughs> Great question. So broad. I mean, there's so many gaps because, for example, the first sort of original piece that I did for the newsletter was an um, interview series called Essential and Black because I noticed so much of the media's narrative around essential workers um, at the start of the pandemic was focusing a lot on white nurses and doctors. And as we soon learned, um, a large percentage of essential workers are women, but especially black and brown women. And so my series um, focused specifically on black essential workers. So I spoke with um, a young black security guard who worked at a homeless prevention center. I spoke with um, a pregnant woman who worked at um, as a hospital administrator. Um, and so, you know, I, I wanted to show to my audience that, you know, your voice and your story during this pandemic does matter, especially, again, because of how we are being disproportionately impacted. That that's, that leads me to a good point. Um, so just last week, the president stood in front of a rally and said uh, that uh, the coronavirus af affects basically nobody. And that was happened to be the mm. same day or the day before we essentially crossed that grim milestone that 200,000 Americans had died. Um, what do you think contributes to this disparity between some people thinking that it affects nobody and then other people knowing that it's actually a really, really big deal? Hmm. I think it, <laughs> again, another very great broad question. I think it just goes back to sort of what your experience is living in this country, living in America, and what realities you face, right? If you consistently experience and witness systemic racism in various points of your life throughout your entire life, it's going to be more likely that you're willing to accept you know, inequities and systemic racism and oppression and white supremacy and all those being very real. Um, but honestly, if, if again, in the black community and, you know, in Latino community, indigenous communities, you'll speak to someone and they know at least a handful of people who've been infected by the coronavirus or have died from the coronavirus or whose family member is an essential worker. Like my mother is um, a nurse, um, just as there are a lot of, you know, black Caribbean um, immigrants who work in the medical profession, in the profession. My mother is one. Um, I mean, it's it just goes back to, I think, empathy and really understanding that, you know, there are intersectional identities. And, you know, if, 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 if you've never been one of those disenfranchised, you know, within one of those disenfranchised communities, you know, there's, there's just that gap. Right. So I have a question from a viewer, uh, Andrew Martin. Um, he asks... Uh, how do you stay resilient in tumultuous times like 2020? What brings you joy? What helps you keep going? Hmm. Good question. Um, I stay resilient. <laughs> uh, number one, <laughs> I know. Number one, um, I go to therapy. Um, I really advocate therapy, um, especially to people from disenfranchised communities. Um, I recent, uh, a few weeks or months ago, I did an article from New York Times called Self Care for Black Journalists. And one of the journalists told me about the Open Path Collective, which operates on like a sliding pay range. So it's affordable. And you could also select um, your, to, you could search for a therapist by ethnicity or race, which is also very crucial sometimes because you're just going to 
understand, you know, different nuances in terms of your identity and, and how you experience um, the world. But I would also want to add, you know, I'm a big watcher of TV and I... <laughs> I've been watching Steven Universe, um, just things that make me feel good. Because even though I feel guilty when I'm not working, which is something, again, that I'm working on in therapy, I just don't know what use I'm going to be as a journalist um, and as a member of my, of my community if I am burnt out and angry and frustrated, um, which, you know, I, it, th- those are all valid feelings. Um, but they don't necessarily, they're not, they don't feel good to me. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, therapy and therapy and TV. Good, good tips. I'm here for both of those. <laughs> and they always say you're no good to the movement if you're too burned out to move. Right. So that is also mm-hmm. true. Uh, Patrice, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining me. Um, and thanks. Alan. Yeah. I hope people to subscribe to your newsletter because it's super important. Yes. Thanks. Hi, I'm Megan Molteni, staff science writer here at Wired. Thank you for joining us for this year's Wired 25. We're really happy to have with us here Avi Schiffman. Avi is a 17-year-old senior at Mercer Island High School outside of Seattle and the winner of this year's Webby Person of the Year Award. Back in January, he single-handedly built one of the very first global coronavirus tracking sites, which has today attracted nearly 1.5 billion unique visitors. So we're going to talk about that and some of the other projects he's launched since then. So Avi, thanks for being with us. For sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, you know, these days tracking COVID cases is kind of like second nature, like check email, check Twitter, check COVID cases. Um, There's lots of apps and dashboards (laughs) to do this. But back in January, there wasn't. So like, what were you seeing? Can you take us back to that time? Yeah. Back when I started this website, there were no other COVID trackers that I could find. I mean, the domain for my website, NCOV2019, is, you know, kind of hard to say and kind of ridiculous, but that was just the unofficial name for the virus back then. You know, the name COVID-19 just didn't exist. You know, when I started this website, the only way to find information on the coronavirus, you know, if you wanted the most up-to-date numbers, was to go to Chinese government websites. But, you know, I don't speak Mandarin and, you know, they're just not nice to look at on like a mobile device. All these government websites just, you know, if, if I'm trying to visit it on my phone, I, you know, I just can't, you know, they're make they're made in like the early 2000s. Um, and there's also, you know, news articles that come out every once in a while back then, but those were mostly out of date by the time I read them anyways. And they're not like dynamically updating or anything like that. So I thought it'd be cool to just make like a dashboard to track that. And that's what I did and kind of or, you know, early January. So what did that actually involve, like from a programming standpoint? Yeah, well, I had to make a bunch of web scrapers, which is kind of the same technology that Google uses to, you know, like rank different pages. And what I'm able to do then is, so let's say, I don't know, Korea, they have like a Korean government website, kind of similar to we have the CDC, you know, most countries have that. And then what I'm able to do is basically download all the information on that page with all the HTML. And they have usually like a table of numbers, but, you know, it's all in Korean. But I'm able to just take that and, you know, mix the numbers up and, you know, parse it and whatever and add it to a much larger data set with all the other countries. And I do that for, you know, I guess all 195 countries now and then a bunch of breakdowns. So for the United States, it's another 50 web scrapers. Um, You know, it's a big hassle, but, you know, it gets the job done. Yeah. How long did it take you to put this together? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the original version took me maybe like a, a couple days or something like that. I had already made something very similar for my high school where I was tracking sports. But um, instead of tracking sports, I just, you know, put the link to, uh, you know, Chinese government websites instead and was able to just get that information. Um, and then, you know, just reskinned to basically a sports website I had made. And then, you know, it only took me a couple days to make the first version. But, you know, I mean, every single day for months and months, you know, it took you know, there were new countries getting infected every single day. So those are new web scrapers to make, you know, things were changing format very often. So I had to recode a lot of web scrapers. So, you know, a lot of manual things I had to do every single day for months and months. Now, now it's been pretty stable as most countries, you know, keep the same format and New York is not making like a new dashboard every day, but you know, back in like March and everything, you know, every single day was something new. So, yeah. So since then, you know, it's, it's blown up. It's obviously become this huge thing, but you've, started to move on to some other projects. I know that you've built a site dedicated to writing resources for Black Lives Matter protesters, and next project is 
elections, including some work you're doing with Snapchat. So what can you tell us about that? Sure. Yeah. I'm making something with elections that I hope to release sometime this week. It's, it's, taken me a while just because, you know, I'm not like a, I'm a master of politics or anything, but you know, it's really hard to mix that kind of stuff unbiased, but, um, I've been working on a website I think will be really cool and that'll be out mm, in a couple of days, hopefully. Um, but and yeah, I mean, of, I just, yeah. The, what's on the what website? Kind of um, deficits are you trying to address yeah. there? I'd say like, you know, there's all these things out there to get people to vote, but I feel like once you actually do want to vote, you know, who do you actually vote for? I feel like a lot of people just want to learn more about the actual policies of the candidates that, you know, that they're voting for. And, you know, in a way that makes sense, it's not just some like, you know, government thing. You know, if you go to the campaign websites of Trump or, or Biden, you know, it's really hard just to find the information that you want. And even if you finally do get to some kind of immigration page on these candidates' pages, you know, it's like a couple little quotes or something like that. You can, you can barely see anything. You know, I want to be able to see, you know, past policies, all that kind of stuff, you know, things that they've done in their budget proposals, all kinds of things in just an easy-to-read way that doesn't look like a, you know, boring government kind of page. So I think it'll be really cool. And I, I think the, you know, user interface looks really nice and it'll it'll be a really cool project. And I think people will like it a lot and find a lot of good information on there. Are you going to be able to vote in this year's election? I will, actually. I'll, I'll turn 18 October 26, so I'm pretty excited about that. You know, I, I just barely make the cut, which will be kind of cool. Yeah. I know that um, you're doing all this on top of your schoolwork with an eye toward heading to Stanford at some point. Like, What's drawing you down okay. to Silicon Valley? Sure. I mean... There's plenty of colleges I would want to go to, but Stanford is definitely number one just because they have so many resources for just, you know, tech entrepreneurship. I mean, there are like classes on how to make startups and stuff at Stanford. And I feel like I just don't have that, you know, at like my local community college or something. I mean, there's plenty of good colleges for different things, but I think Stanford is just, you know, they really have a niche of just tech entrepreneurship in the whole Silicon Valley area. You know, there's plenty of colleges around there too, like Berkeley and everything that, you know, I will definitely apply to. Um, I don't know if I'll get into any of them, but you know, not, nothing's 100%, but uh, I hope so. Just because, I mean, there's just so many, you know, connections and opportunities and things that happen in Silicon Valley that might not happen if I'm in like, you know, Florida or something like that. Yeah, just one final question for you, Avi, before we have to go. Do you think sure. coding should be a required part of a kid's education today? Um, You know, that that's a common question, and a lot of people will, you know, say that everyone should learn to code. I really don't think that everyone should learn to code just because it's a very complicated thing to learn. You need to be able to sit at a computer for just, you know, like eight hours straight or something like that. I mean, I could stay at my computer if I didn't need to sleep or eat. Like I could just stay on there like indefinitely, but a lot of people just can't stay on their computer for a long amount of time. And, you know, you really need to be able to do that if you're going to be doing programming. I mean, it takes hours and hours, but the actual concept of coding is something that I think should be taught in just you know, some kind of way. I mean, the whole if then statements, all that kind of stuff teaches you to problem solve in all kinds of different ways. I mean, I only spend like 1% of my time actually typing, you know, code on my laptop. Most of the time it's just thinking about how you're going to solve a problem in the most efficient way. And, you know, talking to people about how you would even solve these problems in the first place. Um, you know, there's so many good resources online to learn how to code. Um, you know, you can really learn anything online from, you know, underwater basket weaving to, you know, how to code in C sharp or anything. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Avi. Thanks for um, showing us sure. that, you know, there's a way to solve any problem if you <laughs> put your mind to it. Um, and we hope the rest of you stick around for more Wired 25 after this. For sure. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Adam Rogers. I'm a senior correspondent at Wired. Thank you for being with us for Wired 25. Uh, we're really happy to have with us here uh, Audrey Tong, the digital minister of Taiwan. They're a, a, a global voice for open source technology, for digital democracy, the youngest cabinet minister in Taiwanese history. Um, and they're also part of a government that has had a, a tremendous success in dealing with the pandemic disease, COVID-19, partially for a lot of the the work that they've done. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, Minister, thanks for taking the time for doing this. Sure, of course. Good local time, everyone. Before we do anything else, I want to ask you to be a little bit of a wired correspondent for me, um, because Taiwan has had um, 150 cases of COVID-19 and seven deaths. Uh, that's 0 0.03 deaths per 100,000 people in the population, compared to 66 deaths per 100,000 in the United States for the CDC. So I want to ask you, what is it like there 
being there. Is everyone wearing masks? Are businesses closed or open? Are schools open? Are people mm -hmm. on transit? What's just, what's, what is it like being in a place that isn't dealing with the pandemic the sure. way the United States is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do have our max handy, as you can see here, yeah. uh, and people do wear it if uh, they can't keep uh, physical distance, especially uh, in a uh, more closed room. Uh, so although there are, of course, very large gatherings, uh, such as, I don't know, tens of thousands of people going to concerts, movies, baseball games, and so on, they do all wear masks. Uh, and uh, there's also thermometers, um, that uh, portable ones that checks your temperature when you enter the public buildings. and. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's the most visible changes you can see. But otherwise, life is normal. The response that Taiwan was able to mount was fast, involved a lot of masks, involved mm -hmm. um, dealing with people at airports coming in and out. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that part of the thing that enabled all of that is was data, was a national medical mm -hmm. records database. And you worked mm -hmm. on attaching mask distribution to that. Mm -hmm. how, how important was that national database? And how important is the kind of open data and people working mm -hmm. with data that you work on connected mm -hmm. to that? The uh, idea very early on uh, is that we need to reach um, this kind of physical vaccine availability of three quarters. Uh, that's a number that's uh, literally like we're all striving for since uh, around January to finally reaching it around early March uh, to get uh, three quarters of population into the habit of wearing masks and hand sanitation. Uh, and so because of that, we uh, instead of you know, using any sort of top-down um, lockdown or takedown uh, mechanisms. We simply relied on the pharmacists uh, who already had experience dispensing, uh, like, recurring prescriptions uh, for the elderly and so on. Um, a very interesting uh, system where everybody has the IC card called the National Health Insurance Card, which is by law only useful for public service and never for commercial purposes. And we built uh, the mask dispensing, so, so to speak, uh, rationing system on top of that. And then uh, we published not only as open data, uh, which would probably mean every one day or every week uh, update rate, but open API, which is every 30 seconds um, update on all the availability of all the pharmacies in all the masks. And so uh, the end result is that people queuing in line can refresh on their phone uh, and see people queuing before them actually purchase two or three or nine nowadays or 10 for a child, uh, and then uh, keep this whole system honest and accountable by participatory auditing, essentially, uh, instead of relying on a central database to do all the auditing. If they, they notice anything wrong, they would just call this toll-free number 1922 and report whatever they have seen on the ground. So it's also a co-creation system. Did people do something interesting, do anything interesting with the APIs? Was there... Mm -hmm. did, yeah, did there's more than their... 140 applications. There's not only the obvious visualization and chatbots and voice assistants and so on, but there's also analysis, uh, like uh, whether it's an even or uneven distribution. There was a legislator uh, in Gao uh, who worked as VP of data analytics Analytics at Foxconn, so she, she knows something about data. Uh, and then uh, she uh, brings uh, this open street map based analysis uh, to her interpolation in the parliament uh, to the Minister of Health and Welfare, Chen Shizhong, uh, and said, you know, while your map looks like uh, evenly distributed, it's only on kind of a map distance. But if you take into account the more rural areas, the time they spend on public transport, the actual supply and demand actually looks very different. And it's actually not an even distribution. Uh, and the Minister and simply said, legislator, teach us. And then we started working uh, with the open source community and revised our distribution uh, strategy the very next day, and also introducing pre-ordering and 24 hours pickups on the convenience stores uh, to make it more even. Uh, and so, of course, MP got very happy and posted on her social media saying that yesterday's interpolation is tomorrow's upgrade, uh, which is, I think, a pretty good slogan. Is that the kind of participatory democracy that you have hoped for? You've been an advocate for this long before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the ideal of what you meant. There was this mm -hmm. crisis and, mm -hmm. and the, the access to the data allowed people mm -hmm. to sort of code their own solutions in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. conjunction with the government. Is that, I mean, mm -hmm. that sounds great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course, of course. And, and also I will add to it in that uh, it, it takes a lot of trust from the government to the citizenry. If we uh, 
do not publish like data in such a radically transparent and real-time fashion, uh, it will be taken as kind of a, a distrust, right? We are the experts, the citizens knows very little, and so we, we shouldn't publish anything, unquote. Uh, but uh, by publishing the data in real time and by keep saying essentially legislators uh, teach us, uh, or it's a great idea, or let's think about it together, and so on, uh, it's almost like a Pygmalion effect, right? Well, mm -hmm. Where uh, the more uh, citizens uh, receive such kind of trust messages from the government, the government powers believes in people, then the more trustworthy actually the people become. When you spoke to my to my colleague Andrew Leonard um, for the story that we did about you, you you um, made a, an analogy between building the possibility for this kind of open data and digital democracy with with Taoism. You talked about the, a, a poem I think that had said that you the the usefulness the useful part of the mm -hmm. pot is where there is no pot, and that you had mm -hmm. created something similar. I want to kind of get you to talk about that some more about how this mm -hmm. kind of relates to a Taoist philosophy about mm -hmm. what open mm -hmm. data should be and, and what democracy should look like. Does it relate to that? Mm -hmm. The full uh, chapter, I think it's chapter 11, uh, it's uh, the use of not. Uh, it goes like, 30 spokes meet in a hub. Where the wheel isn't is where it's useful. Hollowed out, clay makes a pot. Where the pot's not is where it's useful. Cut doors, cut windows to make a room. Where the room isn't, there's room for you. So the huh. profit in what is, is in the use of what isn't. Terms like NGO, non-governmental organizations, NPO, non-profit organizations, um, the use of what is, what is profit-seeking and what is government, is in the use of what isn't, is in the NGOs and NPOs, uh, or as in Taiwan we call it the social sector. If the social sector determine the use of what isn't then, <laughs> of the business sector and the public sector's uh, infrastructures, uh, then we're in a much better place, a much more resilient society, because everybody can, instead of being you know, data literate, they can be data competent, uh, instead of uh, just receiving and understanding media and messages and uh, narratives, they can be producers of media and messages and narratives. And that's the idea of the use of not. You worked in Silicon Valley for a while. Do you, yeah. do you think that that has relevance to the kind of the philosophical approach in Silicon Valley, the sort of disruptive entrepreneurship, move mm -hmm. fast and break things for profit motive. Does it relate to them? Can the, can the people who think about things that way understand the structure for democracy that you're laying out? Can you imagine them changing toward that? Certainly. Um, I mean, the, the core of the internet governance, uh, if you followed how IETF works, uh, which uh, now they also say that they're uh, built for its users, um, which is a very uh, political statement, a RFC to make. Um, and, and that is, uh, first first of all, that's, that's governance. It, it's actually politics. And it's good to see IETF like, admitting like we're a governing entity. Uh, and also, um, the idea of rough consensus a running code um, is both, of course, move fast and break things, because that's permissionless innovation. But there's also a sense of rough consensus in it, meaning that uh, people need to feel that they can live with uh, whichever uh, innovations that's there, right? Uh, and so I think there's a, a core in the IETF, in the internet engineering uh, ideas, that uh, as long as you publish um, very quickly your failures, <laughs> as well as your successes, uh, then and then you're fine because you're basically making the community learn from your failures. And our mask availability map actually uh, was a, a big failure for many pharmacists on the first day of launch, which is early February, because they're handing out uh, the uh, cards uh, in exchange of those uh, IC cards. And so they swipe the IC cards quite slowly uh, while uh, making sure that they uh, can hand out those uh, allocated quotas very quickly. Um, and so there's a discrepancy and there's even some pharmacists that uh, use uh, such mechanisms uh, just very uh, loudly announced on the front door, don't trust the app. Uh, and so it's not like it's it's utopic uh, the, the right. very uh, first time, right? So the take a number system, the limited time sales and so on uh, invented by the pharmacist could be seen as permissionless innovation, certainly not uh, you know, foretold by the CECC, by the Central Epidemic Command Center, uh, but with um, such ideas. We work with the civic technologist. We improve the automated process. And more importantly, we change the API every Thursday to reflect uh, what actually works in the ground. Uh, and so we introduce the time uh, slots uh, for the map builders to actually show the pharmacists only in the time that they open. Uh, we introduce a uh, button that each pharmacist can press and disappear from the map uh, and so on. And so this idea is that when the government is willing to understand the needs of pharmacists, provide such a digital space for mutual participation, 
then we can complement each other and win back more social trust. And that is how the so-called pandemic fighting national team grow uh, stronger and stronger. I guess I'm trying to figure out the how to what what the architecture would be among sort of the the governance of the specific technology government in general the people who are building the technology which in the United States are are, are very separate and then the experience that so many citizens have of this kind of technology which is in addition to usefulness and also convenience is one of trolling and harassment and disinformation and a sort of politics of opposition. And what, what made it possible to build that in Taiwan that would make it possible also in the United States to have a system of that kind of trust and usefulness? What works in Taiwan is basically a paradigm shift that we see democracy as a set of technologies. Uh, and so there's a lot of room for technologists to work with democracy. And we're not satisfied with only, say, uploading three bits per person every four years, which is called voting, by the way. Uh, and we work on <laughs> increasing the bit rate. And when you frame it like this, there's far more room for the technologists to work with the democracy proponents. And being you a younger democracy, a of course, bit. we're more willing to experiment, but there's nothing um, preventing the American experiment, the great American experiment from experimenting with democracy again. That three bits, three bits a year just broke my heart. I don't know if you could see it on screen, but sure, that's the only time they ever hear from me is when I go say, well, that's that person or that person, I guess. That's an interesting phrase, that description of, of democracy as a kind of technology. It's a technology for working the levers of government, right, of like, of how do you actually make the government do what it's supposed to, and you want more responsiveness. I hadn't, I hadn't uh, thought of that structure. In that vein, we actually had a question from a viewer, too. Donald Statton asked a question, how do we remove politics from science and technology? Thank you for that, Donald. Before I ask you to answer that, I want to say it does sound like you're proposing entirely the opposite of that, that what you're saying is that we should be injecting science and technology into politics and politics into science and technology. Um, so how do I, should those be decoupled or should they be more tightly coupled? Yeah, in, in Taiwan, uh, before the sunflower occupied, before 2014, it's true that when people hear about science and technology, they mostly think about natural science and apply industrial technologies, including digital technologies. On the other hand, social science are science too, and social technology, such as democracy, uh, is uh, an application of science, which is, means that it's technology. It's just bringing technology to where people People are instead of asking people to conform to technology which would be disruptive. And the whole idea of the Taiwan model is that we make sure that the technologies come to where people are, adapt to people's needs, and empower people closest to the pain to be technologists. Uh, in other words, build competence, not literacy. Uh, and that is the core of the K-12 curriculum. That's the core of the broadband as human right uh, governing structure. And that's at the core also of our response system of the CECC. Because you see, when CECC um, sees cases, uh, and I'll use one example to illustrate this, uh, where one um, nightclub employee was diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, and we can imagine that in special spaces such as those, both guests and employees are very sensitive to privacy. But in terms of pandemic prevention, like holding natural science, right, uh, or biological science in this case, um, to, to hunt, um, you know, failing to provide reliable information for contact tracing would lead to very significant vulnerability. So it looks like a, a, a trade-off. Uh, but uh, it's only a trade-off if you do not innovate. So we innovated. Uh, the government did not invoke sanctions or order nightclubs to close down, to, to quarantine it. Um, such measures could, of course, strengthen the uh, public health scientist, but it also strengthens the stigma society already attached to nightclub workers. Uh, and that also causes then the business to go underground. And that is what happened during the great prohibition uh, in USA. Right? And so both situations would only substantially uh, make the uh, public health situation even un more unpredictable because there's no reliable data. And the reliable data is the foundation of trust. And so uh, thanks to the fact that many experts at the CECC in Taiwan already had extensive prior experience with HIV, U equals U, and so on. And so these experts devise a practical system called a real contact, not real name. So as long as people could be effectively contact in case of the outbreak, there's no real name necessary. And we also explain the scientific crux, which is physical distancing must be maintained uh, to prevent droplet infections. And so we say, as long as the nightclubs achieve this, local government could open them up. And so as a result, the business do innovate, um, such as living 
giving code names, single use emails, prepare mobile numbers, <laughs> wearing hats with this plastic shield to maintain physical distance, I can go on. And so even if even nightclubs could join this scientific team of pandemic fighting, then social trust would be much more easily held uh, due to pandemic prevention. This is about empowering even nightclub workers to be kind of like an amateur epidemiologist and such innovator. It's such a fascinating structure because you already have people sort of operating in a semi-anonymous demimond in some ways where they're like they're already working with with anonymizing because that's what that's how they build trust with their mm -hmm. clients with their customers mm -hmm. that's right that's fascinating i am thinking about the range of people's knowledge and abilities in the u.s with how they work with technology and even with kids who we would say are the you know are so great at operating their devices and stuff and are so related to that um it does require giving people the structure to learn how to do this stuff you're not necessarily teaching them how to code but they have to learn mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. what the devices are capable of doing in advance, don't yeah, they? Yeah, and, and also the, the security uh, parameters, how to wield code uh, responsibly and so on, which is not unlike, you know, the original technology called fire and how we teach fire use, you know, in the primary classes. Uh, it's called cooking classes, by the way. Yeah. The uh, user interface with fire has to be very carefully managed. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Yeah. I want to bring that back around, especially to thinking about the relationship with, with COVID-19. Taiwan had seen a coronavirus outbreak once in advance and was prepared. There was some readiness to deal with it as soon as it became clear that this could potentially be another pandemic. Those structures have to be built in advance too, right? Like what you're describing is a commitment to to an infrastructure that just waits and is prepared for any kind of change in a way that I find myself very jealous of, right? Like you have to have that stuff ready to deploy before you know you're going to need it. Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, the structure, the societal trust structure need to be there first, uh, obviously. And uh, that's, uh, as you said, what everybody above 30 years old anyway, remembering the SARS 1.0 uh, initial release uh, would, <laughs> would help <laughs> because that, that really builds uh, like a very strong incentive to not go to the route of locking down uh, because we, we did have a lockdown of the Hoping Hospital unannounced with no uh, determination Determined like days to to end the lockdown. It was very traumatic, uh, and so people, when hearing about oh SARS 2.0 Im imminent release, uh, we we basically said okay, we don't know the feature set, but we <laughs> assume that it's the same as SARS 1.0, uh, and, and in which case uh, we must strive uh, to quarantine at the borders and with no lockdown uh, if we can help it. The idea of a societal response system uh, that already trusts, for example, the uh, usefulness of mask wearing and so on. That's of course, already the case. Uh, but the other system, the technological system, the response systems and so on, were, were not in place. We basically built it in very short order, like within days. Uh, and uh, we fail very publicly. Uh, and then uh, when people call 1922 saying that, hey, you're rationing masks, uh, but uh, my boy only had pink medical mask. He doesn't want to wear it to school. You're depriving him of education rights uh, or he will be bullied and so on. Uh, and uh, we remedied it very quickly, right? So 24 hours after everybody in the CECC daily press conference wore pink medical mask in solidarity, and the administration even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. Uh, and so that boy became the most hit boy in the class, and that's gender mainstreaming for you. It's not to have the structure, the technological structure, in place before any um, crisis. It's just co-evolving with the crisis to make sure that people see whichever new idea they have gets amplified in very short order, weeks um, or days or hours even. And then you will harness the energy that was originally directed uh, to the anxiety and fear and doubt into co-creation. And co-creation is, is very joyful, right? So the spokes dog, uh, Zong Chai, always publishes in a very cute manner the physical distancing, you know, going outdoors, you have to maintain two Shiba Inus away, uh, indoors, <laughs> three dogs away. <laughs> and, so, and once you laugh about it, you literally cannot feel um, outrage again, because it's two very different emotional outlets. And that's the core of the co-creation strategy called humor over humor. It's been an obvious success so far. I hope it continues. Uh, Minister Aru Tong, Digital Minister of sure. Taiwan, thank you so much for doing this and for explaining this. It's, um, it's actually quite hopeful. I hope, we, I hope we figure out some of the same things that you have in the US. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Live long and prosper. Prosperity and long life. Hi. Uh, Hi, my name is Dan. Are we, are we going? Bye.
Okay. My name is Dan Duane. I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm a journalist, and I've been looking into the wildfire situation in California for a little over a year now. And uh, I've learned quite a lot from our two the two uh, fire science researchers talking now. Um, David Saw, a uh, principal investigator in a uh, fire science consortium called Pyrogens, and a professor at the University of San Francisco. And Leroy Westerling, a um, professor at University uh, of California, and head of one of the working groups of Pyrogens. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. How are you, Dan? Good. Good to see you guys. So, okay, so uh, I'll just to sort of bring our our listeners up to speed here. We, um, I got interested in this topic a couple of years ago when, after the horrific fires of 2018, and I had, I had about that time, I to go to the mountains a lot, I had noticed that about 150 million trees had died in the Sierra. And I got to thinking, gee, what happens when all 150 million trees catch on fire? We're going to see some really, really big fires. And that, that led me into kind of discovering the, the world that you guys live in full time. All the fire science researchers are, have been aware for quite a long time that uh, we are already aware of sustainable, uh, violent conditions, and likely heading into the time of even worse. And uh, so, one of the things I was sort of most delighted to discover when I connected with you was a lot of that there's very real work already being done, both to make sense of the kinds of fires we've seen, to figure out how to model them, and to make potentially useful predictions for the future about the kind of the kind we might see. Um, and so to that end, uh, David, why don't, why don't you start a little by just telling us telling us about the um, the genesis of Pyregens. California Energy Commission um, put out a call to to help identify, um, you know, how how to build the next generation of wildfire models. The state itself, California itself, is dealing with wildfires on an ongoing basis. You see it in the news. It's it's a major problem, and it's a major problem not only for the utilities but for people and the environment. And so, what we ended up doing there was a large scientific community wildfire scientific community, we decided to band together and, and go after this proposal as a large consortium uh, in a way that's open and transparent and where co-learning could occur, not only within the scientific community itself, but within specific stakeholders, starting with the state, the IOUs, and the general public. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, it's, it's building a huge table that we're able to bring a bunch of scientists around in a transparent and open way to, to have the hard conversations that are needed in this this time of great change, time of great change in terms of climate, uh, in terms of policies, and in terms of the environment itself. And and Leroy, I, how about telling me about so so you run one of uh, one of several working groups within this consortium, sort of research working groups within the Pi Regions Consortium. Um, tell me tell me about uh, your working group and some of the sort of big and difficult unexplained questions about, um, or I'm sorry, unanswered questions. Some of the the questions that uh, that you you know that you've been working to answer about the wildfire predicament in California. Sure. So I, I lead working group four, and working group four is basically responsible for the long term projections. So Pi Regions as a whole is looking at everything from analysis of historical f extreme fires and then uh, you know hourly to multi-day outlooks, seasonal forecasts, and then long-term projections out to the end of the 21st century. And we are really tasked with trying to understand how to resolve some of the uncertainties uh, and allow the state and communities across California to manage risks around wildfire going forward. And some of the some of the biggest constraints have been when we're doing these models, we're putting them together based on what we understand about fires in the recent past, especially, because that's when we have the most data. But then we're projecting them forward into a time where the climate 
extremes can far exceed what's been observed in the recent past. So we have to understand not just how well our models work reproducing the past that we've observed recently, but how they behave in the future in novel climates and interacting between those novel climates and say how we manage the landscape and the future development footprint. And so some of the biggest challenges have been how to incorporate things like those uh, lightning strikes that we had this year, right? Uh, you don't, we don't predict where lightning is going to strike, but we have to understand how that adds to that, to that variability and that risk. Or um, there are tens of millions of dead trees in the Sierra Nevada from the beetle outbreaks and, and, and severe drought that we had in the last decade. And, and so we're trying to understand how to incorporate that into our modeling as well so that we can see um, what future fires would look like in these really altered fuels from tens of millions of so, dead trees. So, so one of the one of the things that I, I, I think, um, you know, uh, has perhaps not been, in, in my view, quite enough of the public conversation around wildfire in California is that, you know, we, t we tend to look toward, in the media, we tend to look toward fairly easy metrics to measure how bad wildfires are, like by saying, the easiest one, of course, is sheer acres burned. And yes, our wildfires in California are getting bigger very quickly year after year in terms of sheer acres burned. Um, but really, they don't, in terms of the total acreage burned across the state every year, we're still pretty far behind where California was as a natural system 100 years ago in terms of annual acres burned. And it, se it seems to me that in some ways the, the really more astonishing metric and the one that tells us more about why wildfire has become so incredibly disruptive in our lives uh, in recent years is the sheer severity of the fires that we're seeing. The... Uh, the extreme rate of fire spread, the extreme rate of energy release, um, some sort of strange weather phenomena around fire. Um, and so, David, why, why don't you talk to me a little bit about how those questions, how, you know, how that aspect of fire change in California plays into uh, the research that Pyregens is doing um, and, sure. uh, and yeah, the sort of solutions or insights. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, like, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, you know, the size and severity of fire is important, but the nature of fire itself, how, how these large wildfires are changing and evolving on the landscape is also important. And so, you know, Leroy alluded to the fact that he's the lead in our working group four, which is focused on our long-term projections. Uh, Chris Lautenberger is in charge of our work group three, which is in charge of our short-term projections. But the nature of fire itself, we have broken up into two separate working groups, right? We have one, Janice Cohen, that's leading extreme fire weather, right? Plume drop driven events. What creates them? What causes them? What are the atmospheric climatological conditions that are important to understand when we look uh, at wildfire and the interactions with the uh, with the weather now and with the changing climate in the future. Uh, we also have another working group um, uh, that's led by Scott Stevens, uh, John Battles, and Mark Finney that's looking at fuel loading, right? So the fuel loading conditions are also changing over time. And we're seeing that, you know, back to what Lira was talking about, the loads in the forest are, are at a level that are, you know, outside of our historic norms. And we don't have any points in history where we could look to see examples of it. So folks like Finney are looking at examples of like Dresden or Hiroshima to look at firestorms that occurred in those environments to see if they can capture some of the physics involved in that uh, and see how we can integrate that into our existing understanding of wildfire models. You switch over to where Janice is looking at things and her group. It's not, you know, wildfires not ubiquitous across the state. You could kind of think of it in the most general terms as different fire types, what I like to call fire nature, uh, that are sprinkled across the different state. Some of our models are really good at nailing them down. Uh, and, you know, these surface weather, surface wind-driven events, our Rothamal-based models, are pretty good at capturing them. In the simplest terms, if you want to call plume-driven events, we don't have models that can capture that. We need to understand the basic physics. We need to build the models right now to be able to scale up and capture, um, you know, and, uh, sorry, a predictive ability around that. Leroy, let me I'm just sorry. step in. To, I'm, I'm sorry, David. Yeah. Let me just step into to, to clarify one thing for our for our listeners that the what we mean by plume driven events are these uh, are these wildfires that 
become big enough that they're they generate a big enough convective column, a big enough sort of column of heat and smoke rising up from the fire that that column begins to generate its own weather. And it be, and most importantly, it begins to drive it, the, the sort of core phenomenon is this way in which it can drive a sort of 360 degree radial wind field into the fire itself. So that as if the fire has found a way to stoke itself and to drive yeah. it you know, hotter and faster. And, um, and, and Leroy, the, um, and, and so let's, let's be sure to touch on two things. One is, you know, Leroy, you've spent a lot of time studying how climate change, uh, interacts with, um, with our sort of forest management practices and wildfire behavior. So, and I think one of the questions that's been really getting wrestled with a lot in the last few weeks is, is precisely that one. So how about airing out for us the relationship between things like Forest management practices, which is to say logging, not logging, thinning, prescribed burns, uh, and and climate change, and then ultimately the kinds of fire behaviors that we're seeing. Yeah, and I also want to address quickly one thing you just said uh, when you were asking the question to David, and that was uh, saying, comparing what we currently are looking at to uh, yeah. what you call the natural fire regime. And I think it's important yeah. to keep in mind that that was a fire regime that was also managed by people. Yeah. And so a lot of the area, additional area burned in the state was fires that were set to manage the landscape for different objectives uh, and very different from the fires we're seeing today, which are enhanced in some places by the interaction between some of the impacts of climate change and the legacy of increased fuels on the landscape from past fire suppression, but also changes in land use, like grazing or fragmentation of, of, the, of the landscape. Um, and, and so people often will point to that fuels management issue because it's a very graphically obvious thing. Right? If you look at photographs of 100 years ago versus today, you can see really characteristic changes in the, in the structure of forests throughout the mid elevations of Sierra Nevada. Um, and, and those increased fuels there have made those forests more susceptible to climate change. So as uh, you warm up the planet, right, you're evaporating more moisture. This is an arid region, so there's not like an excess reservoir of moisture that can compensate for that. And we're not changing precipitation that much so far. So, so uh, that's drawing more moisture out of those um, ecosystems, out of those fuels. And, and in places where the forest has gotten really overcrowded, shall we say, uh, you have that exacerbated by competition for moisture between the, the trees. Uh, in addition, we have um, increased uh, fraction of the precipitation that we get comes as rain and less as snow. And the snow melts out earlier because there's less of it often and because the temperatures in spring are warmer. So that can make the fire season at higher elevations come earlier. And then uh, one of the factors that's been really important at, at lower elevations where most people in California live, and typically not forested, is um, increased variability in precipitation. So as you warm up the planet, you're changing uh, the temperature difference between the higher latitudes and the equator. That changes the atmospheric circulation patterns. And we often see uh, in, in projections and, and now in some observations, this increased frequency of sort of slower weather patterns set up you know, wet or dry, cold or hot for a longer period of time. And that just increases the extremes. And in particular, we've seen in recent years, a lot of uh, autumns where the typical timing for fall precipitation it changes. And, and instead of getting a big uh, storm that comes in in Northern or Southern California and sort of shuts down the fire season in terms of big severe fires, um, the fire season can extend weeks or months later into the to, into the fall and even the winter, and as that's happening, the probability of a big wind event is increasing the later you get in the year, just because of the change in the seasons, and, and so we get these big wind-driven events in the fall, in addition to these more plume-driven events like we, we're seeing this summer, and so all of these things are interacting on landscape in different places, and, and basically you have these fuels that are much drier for much longer interacting with the timing of precipitation and, and winds in the fall and, and uh, producing 
you know, actually a fairly complex situation. It's not just like one factor dominates. Yeah. In yeah. Every... And hey, we have we have a, a question. Yeah. We have one question from. Bring it in. One question from Michael. Mike Arendt asks, what major economic and human migration shifts do you see in the next 10 years due to global climate change? And, and feel free to apply that to the wildfire situation in, in California, of course. Okay. Yeah, not, not globally, just specifically in California. Well, uh, you know, wherever you want to go with that. Yeah. Well, I think so. for us, it's useful to focus on California because that's yeah. our uh, yeah. topic here. But um, it's not clear to me that people are going to abandon, uh, say, the wildland urban interface or more rural areas of California just because of fire. Uh, it might be because of a combination of, say, insecure water supply and increased fire risks uh, in, playing out in some rural communities, for example. But uh, California is a big state. It's got a uh, housing crisis, a shortage of housing. It's expensive to live in the coastal cities. Uh, and then things like COVID are putting pressure on people to sort of spread out more instead of consolidate in, in already urbanized areas. So it's hard to tell you know, how, how that would play out. But if we're going to stay in these rural communities and in these uh, smaller cities and towns that are in embedded in, in fuels in risky places like Paradise and Santa Rosa have, have been in recent, uh, in the news in recent years, um, we need to learn how to manage that risk better. And that means that okay. we need to quantify it, right? If, you, if you're going to get homeowner's insurance, it's going to cover your fire risk. The, whoever's providing that insurance needs to be able to anticipate what the risk actually is and if there are ways to mitigate it. You know, what are the characteristics of homes and communities, the spatial footprint, how we build them, how the vegetation around them is managed that make them more or less uh, robust to wildfire risks? That, that's something that we need to get a better handle on. And that's a forward-looking thing. We can't concentrate on just what we've understood from looking at, say, the past five years, past 10 years, past 20 years. It has to be a science-based projection into the future because the climate system that underlies all of these, these fire risks and the ecosystem that uh, supports fire is, is shifting rapidly because of the legacy of, okay. of, of I'm sorry, we got we're problems. out of time, guys. I'm sorry to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're out of time. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Uh, you know, I look forward to more in the future. Okay, guys, take care. That was fun. Right. Take bye -bye. care. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hello. That was a marvelous day. So many great conversations. Marvelous event. All three days we did. I learned all kinds of things, new ideas, interesting people. I kept coming back today to an idea that Lisa Piccarello talked about. And she's explaining how she solved the Conway knot problem. Right? A problem that no one had been able to solve forever. And she solved it in a week. Well, how did she do it? Well, she knew that if two knots share the same four-dimensional space, they're both either sliced or not sliced. So instead of looking at the Conway knot, what if she built another knot and then analyzed it? Then she could figure out the Conway knot. It was an amazing way, it was an amazing metaphor for this whole event. If there's a problem, and it's an unsolvable problem, how do you turn it around? How do you look at it in a new way? And that was kind of the message of so many of our conversations. And the theme that ran through the problem today in so many, so many different ways was trust, right? How can you trust the government to keep us safe in coronavirus? How can you trust a vaccine? How can you trust what's on your computer screen is real? How can you trust the election results? How can you trust that the news you're getting about coronavirus is safe? And then ultimately, how can we trust each other to keep ourselves safe from coronavirus? And how can we emulate what's happened in Taiwan? It was an extraordinary set of new ways of looking at different elements of the same problem. And it was great counter-programming to the debate last night, which is all about breaking trust. And the reason so many of us were dissatisfied was the sense that the message from that conversation was, it's time to break trust with the American election or with the justice system.
And so to have today new ways of looking at new problems, new ways of understanding trust, I thought was great. So thank you so much to everybody who participated. Thank you to our moderators. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our sponsors. Together globally, for their support, we were able to create Wire 25. And thank you to all of you for watching, sticking through it, sending questions.